Dr. Tim Steffens is an innovative range scientist that works as a joint venture with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension as a range specialist, as well as being a range professor at West Texas A&M in Canyon. And uh, we want to welcome you here to Canadian today. Uh, just take it away. What I'm going to talk about is not so much risk management and, and the things from financial side as much as just talking a little bit about <clears throat> kind of trying to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is we're taking a commodity that has very little value, and that's grass, and we're turning it into something else that somebody's willing to, to pay for. And so Andy asked me to talk about how to market low quality forage into profitable beef cattle. I'm a big fan of those old penny dreadful novels. So the or is, where is the profit in beef cattle? And what I want to do is basically look a little outside the box or maybe think about things in a little different way than some people else do and, and look at why are we in a forage-based livestock business, and where is the money in a beef cow? And basically, we're looking at them as a, as a, as a value-adding enterprise to grass. And a lot of times, we have lost sight of that. <coughs> and, we let, and, and this is not to belittle any of the things that we've heard about this morning with you know, value-added uh, programs and vaccine, those things are really important. But the first thing we've got to do is to produce something at a low enough cost that we're gonna be able to make money most of the time. So I wanna start with a few quotes <coughs> that, that have stuck in my mind over time. Laurie Lasseter, whose dad founded the Beef Master Brief, said one time that if you're dependent on the weather or the market to make a profit, you're not a manager, you're a speculator. He said, the market or the weather may determine how much profit you make, but the fact of the profit ought to be in the sack before you ever start. Jim Garish, has, uh, he's a guy who helps a lot of people with grazing management issues. And he says, the more petroleum and iron you put between the sun's solar energy and your cow's belly, the less profitable you're gonna be. Something we have lost sight of over the years is, you know, cattle thrive on grass if, if we're doing our job right. We, we look at all these inputs there was an old rancher, I don't have this one up there, down by Sanderson. If you've ever been to Sanderson, that is a hard place to serve the Lord now. <laughs> and he was at a deal with a friend of mine, and he said, you know, my granddaddy paid for the ranch hauling things from the ranch to town. He said, my grandkids think they can make money hauling things from town to the ranch. <laughs> We need to keep that in mind. Another friend of mine, he said he thinks he can make, more mo make money owning the best cattle because that's what everybody wants to buy. But he can make more money owning sorrier cattle because nobody wants them when it's time to sell. You can improve cattle and you go up in quality. If you start with the best, all you've got is the gain, right? And he quoted his grandfather saying, nobody makes money putting good stock on poor pasture, but almost anybody can make money putting poor stock on good pasture. A guy named Johann Zeitzman from South Africa, he said that a cow's purpose in life should be to produce beef while she is improving the resource she's standing on. 
And that's some of the things that I want to talk about today. This was some spa analysis that Barry Dunn did in the Northern Plains back in 2000. He compared the lowest 20% of the of profitability producers that they were looking at to the highest 20% and then that middle 60. Now there's a lot of numbers up there and you can draw your own conclusions, but there's some things that kind of stick out in my mind there. One is, what's the difference in weaning waste between the high 20% and the middle 60? But there is a difference in the, num in the amount of dollars that they're getting for. Now, there's a, couple of, there's a couple of ways, and probably both of them, that are in effect. Though. One is some of the things we've heard about this morning. They're doing a good job of marketing. They're picking the right time, the right place. They're having the cattle ready. They know what their customers want, and they're providing that. But another thing that we heard about this morning that's up there. I can have 450 pounds of weaning weight per cow exposed, having a 50% calf crop weighing 900 pounds, right? Or I can have it having a 90% calf crop weaning 500 pounds. Which one's going to bring more money without any kind of a premium? The light calves, right? As an old sheep friend of mine used to say, it takes a dang good lamb to be better than two of them. A lot of times the way we're getting the, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a big, heavy calf. But a lot of times the way that we're getting them, we may be calving at the wrong time of year. We're having to spend a lot of money to keep that cow in shape to breed back. And those things enter in on these kind of issues. The best way to make it to double your money is to fold it up and put it back in your pocket, right? <laughs> the way we make money on a cow is we don't spend a lot on her. You look at the net, and then you look at return on assets. Where can you make 19% on your money? In the stock market. The livestock business is a very profitable business. The used farm machinery business, the transportation business, the feed business, sometimes not so profitable. And so that's the things that I'm wanting to talk about. According to the Livestock Marketing Information Center, in the last, what, uh, 13 years, and most of that's occurred over the last 10, we've increased carrying costs by 225% to $900 a head on the cow. 13 years ago, average was $400, now it's $900. Not even with the buck fifty five steer calves. I mean that doesn't I mean you can maybe still make a little money. Except that doesn't have to take into account the depreciation on the cow or any machinery. They were talking about just cash costs and pasture. Now a lot of people will tell you oh, depreciation, that's just for Uncle Sam. That really don't count. I would say it actually does. I used to ask this question to people, and they would guess. And then I would tell them the answer, and they would never believe me. So I just made a little tape. Average cow with a 90% breed up and a 90% weaning percentage. going to have about four calves in her lifetime. If I pull 
a replacement out to replace her, that's three calves that I've got to make back the drop in her value over her lifetime. Now, maybe you could get another 100 calves out of those 12 that are 12 years old now. If you can, good on you. But it'd take 100 more calves to make the average go up to five. But you may say to yourself, self, you're saying, that's my neighbor. I'm better than that. I can do 95 and 95. If I, with that the case, I'm the six. And you might get another 100 out of those 34. But that's no death loss. That's no bad temperaments you're selling. That's no bad udders, bad legs. That's, I mean, that is just reproductive performance. Average quality cows at Woodard, Oklahoma brought $1,900 about a month ago. Same day, same market. Boner breaker cows bringing about 960. That's $940 of depreciation, and that's the real deal. I mean, that ain't for Uncle Sam. That's how much she lost value as a cull cow. Split over three to five calves. That's a lot of depreciation on that calf's head. What's the value of extra pounds on a calf? I can't tell you how many of these kind of deals I've been to. There's some, are there any feed people here? <laughs> Somebody that's selling the latest product, not guaranteed not to rip, run, snag, or ravel around the edges and makes, you know, cures coughs, colds, and runny nose. They sponsor the meal so they get to give a spiel and they, it's going to cost you X amount of dollars and they say, and then, you know, your calves are weighed 30 pounds more. And if those calves are worth, if those pounds are worth $2.30, yeah, you're going to be a millionaire before you're 30 and marry a model. <laughs> and if all that was true, you would be. Except those extra 30 pounds ain't worth 230 even when cattle are bringing that much because of the slide. Now an extra calf is worth that much. But the extra pounds, and normally this was an anomaly that day. Most of the time when I have looked, you get above 500 pounds and you gave the next pounds away. So marketing, just knowing when to do it can be a big deal. And if you're gonna put more pounds on, you need to be sure they're not costing you more than what you're getting back out of. And again, an extra calf is worth more than those extra pounds. Quite often in the past, value of gain will be somewhere in the 50 cent range. Now it's a little higher. Maybe we have hit a new, a new plateau like we heard earlier this morning. Additional, an additional calf, an additional X number of pounds of another calf it's always going to be worth a lot more than additional pounds on the same case. We make more money running more animals as long as we keep the performance up. More cows. One of our speakers this morning said, you need to know what your cost for running a cow is. In the school that Andy was talking about, 
we've got one of those, we've got a little program of our own that we look at those kind of things. And I ran through. 2% cabin loss, 1% death loss, 1% drive, 96% breed up on everything else, and I think we would all agree that's pretty dang good husbandry. Keeping your own heifers, bull to 25 cows, if you count all your replacement heifers, all your cows, all your bulls, you're going to be lucky to market 67% of your total breeding herd as a winged cat. Now those premiums, there were, I mean, that's a good thing. But a dollar a premium on a calf, you're only getting 67 cents of that back per cow. If I save a dollar on a cow, that's a dollar in my pocket, right? And given that, an extra percentage of a 400 pound calf is worth as much as 13 and a half pounds of additional Cat, additional pounds on the same cat. And then the question is, can you raise a bigger than a 400 pound cat? Then it's worth even more. The thing we've got to keep in mind is, even if we spent nothing on additional inputs, some of them cows are still going to have a cat. And by and large, we're spending mo our money on a whole herd for a marginal increase, right? And, and so you can't say, well, I spend an extra dollar and I get it $2 back on very many things. There are a few. Dr. McCollum has talked a number of times about the return on implant. You put it in each calf and you get that back out of each case. There are some vaccination programs I am a huge believer in. Even if you don't get the premiums, it's a great insurance policy and it helps build a reputation. You have healthy calves, they also have figured out it takes a dang good one to be better than two, especially when you pay a lot of money for one of them. And it dies. But there are a lot of things we spend money on that are kind of a self-inflicted wound, right? Feed is one of them. I don't think it's as big a problem in the panhandle as it is a lot of places. There are, there are places that they have a year-round green season and they are feeding between a ton and a half and two tons of hay a year. Those guys in the Northern Plains, a lot of those on that side of the screen were doing that or more. A lot of them on this side of the screen are feeding when the grass is cooked. Everybody will say that's feeding a lot. Well, I can't do that here. But there's probably somebody down the road that's doing it. I just ran a few figures and I don't want to get too bogged down in the details here. Looking at the cost of forages that are grazed or that are hay. And you, we can argue about whether $22.50 a month is a valid figure for what it takes to run a cow. We can argue about the cost of hay. But it takes really cheap hay to be able to haul it out, take the weather loss, take the wastage on the feed, take the depreciation on the vehicle to haul it out there, take the labor that it takes to put it out there, and be cheaper than letting the cow harvest it herself. 
guy up in Kansas, I have never met this man. I have emailed him a bunch of times back and forth. He is one of my heroes. And he said his goal with his management is to make it where he can market any animal on his place any day of the year and be able to get his money back out. He said that does two things. One, it keeps me from hanging on to something till I lose all my equity in a drought or something else. And he said the other thing that does is it guarantees me a profit. Depreciation on that cow, he don't plan on having a cow that When they kind of start to where they start dropping, somebody else owns them and he has new heifers coming up. He don't spend a lot of money on those heifers because he said, I'd rather cull them while they're a valuable feeder heifer than wait till they're a cull cow. The way we do that is by optimizing the productivity and the conversion of grazed forages that have little or no value and convert them to something that somebody else wants. We do that by helping the cows produce beef, not substituting, trying to get them to live on the resources on the ranch, not hauling resources too. <clears throat> I do this a lot. This ain't rocket science. It's simpler, but it's harder. Rocket scientists, they got to go way out into space. They're shooting a little tiny rocket a long ways, and they got to hit something out there where they're going. But the good part is they know how fast the rocket's going, they know how far away the planet is, they know how fast it's going, and there ain't nothing between here and there, right? <laughs> All we got to do is take an animal whose requirements are changing every day, whose preferences for forages change every day, match them up with plants that are growing every day and changing in quality every day, and become more or less palatable every day by changing the timing, the frequency, the intensity of defoliation, the distribution of where it's going on, and opportunity for growth on those plants. Everything is changing all the time, and we just got to watch what's going on and do something about that. If we got animals in every pasture all year long, but we're moderately stocked, how many of those things can we affect? Can't change distribution, can't change timing, can't change frequency. They're going wherever they want to. Can't change the opportunity for regrowth because so the only thing we can change is the intensity of defoliation. And they're going to go find the best stuff and eat it all the time. Only by controlling when, where, how many, how long, and how often those animals have access to plants are we going to improve the resource. And by doing that, we can run more animals, but hopefully we'll do better. We do that by watching stocking rate. That affects intensity. Recovery periods affect the timing, the frequency, and the opportunity for growth and regrowth. The number of pastures per herd, that affects the timing, the frequency, opportunity for regrowth, and it might improve distribution. How many people got pastures that cattle don't go to all of it? If I can get animals there, I've increased my acreage. If 
effectively. Stocking density, we can affect distribution, maybe. We can affect which plants they eat. And we can affect that average intensity of the foliation. The more cover we have, the more water we get in the ground. The more water we get in the ground, the more grass we grow. The more grass we grow, the more animals we can run. And we can do that at fairly low cost, usually. On animal side, we got to have genetics that fit the country. Right. In a lot of cases, and I think Dr. McCollum will agree, we got more milk in cows, in beef cows today, than what my grandpa used to milk for butter and and meal. And in a lot of cases, they're not able to meet their genetic potential because it ain't out there for them to eat. We have cows that are really big. We're running a 1,400 pound cow today on the same country we were running a 1,000 pound cow on in the 70s we have increased our stocking rate whether we run more cows or not. We manage on the plant side, again, timing, frequency, average intensity, distribution, opportunity for regrowth. We do that by adaptively managing Numbers, number of herds, number and placement of pastures, length of recovery in response to what the animals and the plants are telling us. I have people ask me, how long should a recovery period be after grazing? There's one pat answer for any range geek that you'll ever talk to. It depends. How much is it rain? How tight did you take it? What quality do you need when you come back? What are the needs of the animal today? All those things enter into that. And what it was last year ain't going to be probably what it was this year. You've got to watch what's going on. Is that all there is? There is no more, I guess so. I'm done talking. <laughs> this plaque of recognition presented to Dr. Tim Steffens, AgriLife Extension Range Specialist, in grateful appreciation and appreciation of your contribution to Hemp Hill County from the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service 2016 Beef Conference. Thank you very much. Let's give Dr. Steffens a nice round of applause.